Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. On behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and hope you are blessed by this time in the Word. It's His Word, so I can I can pretty much be guarantee that if you're open to it, you'll be blessed by Amen. it. Amen. Uh, we're continuing on in our study that we started a couple of weeks ago in, about revival. Mm-hmm. A very, very important topic. Uh, yes, and, in these days. And I think mm-hmm. all too often it's a very misunderstood topic, so that's the reason we're doing this study. Mm-hmm. We are in the third part today. Yes. Uh, I don't know we'll conclude today. I kind of doubt it, but mm-hmm. if you haven't seen the others, it's worthwhile for you to go back and take have a, have a, have a glance, have a look. It is the Word of God. All right? All right. So as soon as Mark asks for God's blessing to give us understanding of his word, yes. then we will start the study. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Yes, it's a guide for our mind and love letters for our hearts. Just open up our minds and our hearts so we can renew our minds and fill our hearts with your love. Amen. 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 And Father, as always, I just pray that nothing comes out of my mouth that you haven't put in my heart. Hallelujah. That's right. Okay. Because from the abundance of the heart, heart the mouth, the mouth speaks. speaks. Yes. Okay. Um, I, want, I just want to read the last verses that we were on as we closed last week, mm-hmm. which is in Nehemiah chapter 2. Uh, and I'm going to read from verse 7 on to as far as I go. Okay. Uh, this is Nehemiah. And he said, And I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asphalt, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. I didn't stop there, but um, the reason I wanted you to see that is because that we're picking up in verse 10 now, mm-hmm. and it's important to understand. It says, when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. Right. And then in 219 and 20, it says, but when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. Right. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Not everybody likes real revival. No. I think when we started, I told a story about in Sanford when I'd been invited as we were traveling to go preach revival for a week and I did and it happened and people were very upset when it happened because it changes things and most people don't really like change. It, when it's a result of faith and what our, and that's what our goal should be, especially as it pertains to revival, the approval, it's about the approval of God, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there's so much teaching in the church today about why faith is all about getting this and getting that. And and they quote Hebrews 11 and say it's got to happen now because it's now faith. But did you ever move along from verse 1 in Hebrews 11 to verse 2 in Hebrews 11? Because there it tells you what those faithful people gained by their faith. They gained the approval of God. Now, these, these work plans, these things, Plans of uh, rebuilding, rebuilding were set forth by God. He approved these plans. Absolutely, absolutely. And think, think in terms of this kind of an analogy: rebuilding for revival. Okay, mm-hmm. he's restoring. He had heard, and you know, again, if you haven't seen the first two parts, you need to go see, especially the first one, that sets the stage about how Nehemiah was heartbroken yes, over the, the reports condition. of the condition of the temple, the, the temple, the wall, the right? Wall, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. See, Ezra went, and he went to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Okay, right. Nehemiah went to Jerusalem to build the wall, rebuild the wall. 
Okay, so we'll talk about that, yeah. right? Sambalat, now this is this is really important, okay? Sambalat was connected to the Jewish high priest, Elijah, by marriage of his son to the priest's granddaughter. Hmm. Right? It's a family connection. Family connection. Tobiah, likewise, had connection to the Jews and to Elijah through marriage. Connections that disconnected them from their God, the mm -hmm. Jews, okay? Consider that in light of what Ezra had been writing about the same time. Now, remember I told you Ezra and Nehemiah, the contemporaries, right? right? Mm -hmm. And Ezra wrote and said, Now when these things have been completed, the princes approached me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and, and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands mm -hmm. according to their abominations. Those are the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Hmm. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons. So that the holy race has intermingled with the people of the land. Indeed, the hands of the princes and the rulers have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. Ezra, that's chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Okay. He would go on a little further on there and say, and I'm reading from Ezra 9, chapter verses 12 and 14. So now do not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or their prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your sons forever. Shall we again break thy commandments and intermarry with the peoples who commit these abominations? Wouldst thou not be angry with us to the point of destruction until there is no remnant or any who escape? The word of God still commands today. Let me read from Paul in his letter to, this, to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, I'm reading verses 14 through 18. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Mm -hmm. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. And that's in... That was Second Corinthians six fourteen through 18. There has always been this prohibition about intermarriage between believers and unbelievers right. because it corrupts the believers. Bad company spoils good morals, and you can't get more company than when you marry somebody, right? God doesn't change. God is not a man that he should change, that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will not make it good? As Numbers 23, 19. The word of God does not change. I mean, I'm telling you, it's so commonplace today for Christians to marry non-Christians. Yes. And you think, well, it's all right because it's just that's the way it happens today. Yeah. They believe that they'll change them. It doesn't matter what they think. The word of God doesn't change, and you're commanded not to do it. Right. Not to do it. Not to do it. Not to do it. There'll be dire consequences. Jesus Christ is the word, and he is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. The word doesn't change. No. Okay. But our compromise will never cause God to compromise. That's right. You know, so a lot of times when we compromise, that's taking our white robes of righteousness and making a white flag of surrender, all right? right. Yeah. But God's not going to... God's not going to say, oh, well, that's okay. You know, parents may do that a lot, probably too much. Mm -hmm. But no, God doesn't do that. He's not going to compromise. His word is his word. And as he said to Jeremiah, he watches over to perform his word, right? Because he knows the consequences of every everything that's done against his commandment. We don't. So, th so think about this. Just take it in. This is the word of God. Take it in. Let that word of God become part of you. You know, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's your, it's your necessary food. Yes. And that food becomes a part of you, right? Um, 
Well, I've often said, and I, I really need to talk about this, that the greatest enemy of revival is church leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds harsh. I just want you to think about this, all right? And I don't mean all church leaders. I'm not. No. But that's always been an enemy of revival. Why? Because often church leaders, those people, have a vested interest in the status quo. Mm -hmm. They don't want change. And so this, they resist revival because revival is the ultimate change, right? right? They may do this while seeking church growth. Because church growth is not the same thing necessarily as revival. as revival. Revival is, at its core, a changing of the guard, mm -hmm. right? A change in the power structure. Mm -hmm. Revival returns authority to Christ. Amen. To okay? the head of the, of the church. Because when you're part of a church that is not alive in Christ, the authority rests, I mean... People want you to be bound to that to that organization. Mm -hmm. God wants us to submit it to Him, right? Our 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 entire relationship has to be with the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You're not dependent on a priest on a prophet. Now, listen, God has appointed apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of service, but not to lord it over them. Right. I mean, is that, servants, certainly you, servants. you've read the New Testament enough to know that. That, you know, those who serve, the God, the ones that God appoints, mm -hmm. are there to serve, That's right. not to be served, right. as he was. He said the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served, right? That's right. And we're to imitate him. But the world may see this revival what it leads to as rebellion. When Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem heard about it here, right? Mm -hmm. And what did they say? You're rebelling against the king, mm -hmm. okay? You despised. 219. Despised. 219. Despised us. When Sam, Sambalat, the Horite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Listen to me. When true revival breaks out, freedom breaks out. If therefore the Son shall make you free, you will be free indeed. John 8, 36. I mean, we're talking about revival. Well, we're talking about when revival happens, freedom happens. I now, have a, a note here from previous Bible studies that we've done. And it said, for that verse, falsely accused of a secular crime for Israel. Well... Well, I want to talk about that some. Uh, let me just add this verse, though. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17. Okay. okay? The world doesn't want you free. No. No, it does not. Okay? Satan wants you to serve him. He wants you to be bound to him, right? We are being set free to serve the Lord, not the world's king, mm -hmm. and certainly not ourselves. We who are abiding in the word are free indeed, as Jesus said in John wrote. Yet we are bond servants of the Most High God and slaves of righteousness. Our, our call has to be, nevertheless, thy will be done, right? Yes. So th this is a, a real problem. I may get ahead of myself here a little bit, but are you familiar with the zealots mm -hmm. in, the time, in the time of Jesus? Yes. <clears throat> The zealots were basically a, like a political party, right? Mm -hmm. you, had, you had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes. Those were the three main groups. But a fourth group came into existence just before the, the birth of Christ, mm -hmm. and that was the zealots. zealots. Yeah. They actually came into existence because of the call for the, uh, for the tax oh, right. to have a census taken, mm -hmm. right? So in response to that, they were so upset by that that they had to, they were so inconvenienced and put upon by the Roman government. They wanted to overthrow. They wanted to overthrow it. That's mm -hmm. where the that's where the zealots got their start. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, had not that taken place, well, where would Jesus have been born then? Because it was that tax and that census that caused prophecy. prophecy to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. 
that they moved from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, right. fulfilling the prophecy of Michael. All right. The zealots also. Now it's good to have zeal, but I'm going to, the zeal, we're talking about the political party, the conservative Jewish political party, and um, they were the ones that rebelled or fought against Rome, like in the late sixties or seventy, that caused Rome to destroy Jerusalem. So their political action actually caused the destruction of the temple mm. that they thought they were going to protect. Mm. Because they were leaning on their own understanding, okay? They didn't know the consequences of their actions. They didn't know the consequences of getting politically involved That's right. with what is always a spiritual problem. Right. A spiritual problem re requires a spiritual solution, okay? There's another thing here that I just want to point out, okay? As I, as I mentioned, Ezra went to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah went to repair the wall, to, repair the, to rebuild the, mm -hmm. the wall, okay? It requires both. You've got to be strong inside and out, yeah, right, okay? Right. God has changed you. If, you. if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, That's you're temple. a new creation in Christ Jesus. That temple is new. That temple, you now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. But yes, we have a responsibility with the, with the flesh, the outward the wall, so to That's speak, right. okay? So bear that in mind. Mm -hmm. Don't become legalistic about it, but do understand that you've been entrusted with everything that God has given you, and you are therefore responsible for it, okay? But it's not just so much about whether you're way too much or you're too short, too tall, or anything. Like that. It's about the fact that you carry, you carry, if you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, you are carrying the presence of God into every place. You need to be conscious of that. Your physical actions, you're responsible for them because they bear, they're bear. supposed to bear witness of your relationship with God. So if you're doing things that are ungodly, I'll tell you what, that wall has been breached. Okay? All right. So anyhow, be strong inside and out. Let me just yes. leave it at that. All right? I'm going to go now to chapter 3. Three is a, a really interesting chapter. Oh, oh, how many oh, hundreds? Oh, 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 how many hundreds or thousands who had a mind to work rebuilt the wall, protecting the temple? Right. For thirty-two verses in chapter three, the Word of God identifies peoples and families who put their hands to the work. Right. right. It is highly probable, and I'm not saying this judgmentally. I'm just saying this as an observation. It is highly probable that most Christians have never read through this chapter verse by verse. Is that, have you read through it verse by verse? Yes. Okay. But Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 Every word... Every verse is God-breathed and profitable. Sometimes you have to dig, right? You know, when Jesus was telling the parables in, in Matthew 13, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the treasure is hidden and you got to dig, okay? And I promise you, there's a treasure hidden here in mm -hmm. chapter 3. Because if you read this over and over and over, this this family, Eliashab, the high priest arose with his brothers. Next to him, the men of Jericho built. Next to them, Zechariah, the son of... It goes on and on and on and on. But if you look at verse 20, there's something really interesting here. Because it says, after him... Okay, the first one, he's talking about Ezra, the son of Jeshua... The official of Mitzvah repaired another section in front of the other. And after him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section from the angle of the, to the doorway of the house of Eliashab, the high priest. Of all of these people, literally by thousands, mm. God takes note of one person. Baruch. Baruch. Because, which means blessing, by the way. Right. Because he zealously worked. Right. right? 
All the others, they just talked about repairs, repairs, or built and repaired. Yeah. But he's the only one that zealously... Out of all those people... Repaired. God took note of him, all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know what? That one man who stood out from the crowd, that word, that's an eternal word. His name yes. is written <laughs> for all right. eternity as the one... Who is different? Okay, and it's not just a matter of whether you're working on the wall. I don't care whatever if you're a butcher, you, or a baker, or a candlestick maker. Whatever you do, whatever, you put your whatever hand your hand finds to do, you should be doing with a zeal for God, doing as unto the Lord, and with a zeal for God. If nobody else notices, I promise you, God, God will know. Notice. Yes, God will take notice of the fact that you're doing that. People may not. All right, people may not notice that. But God will notice that. It doesn't go unnoticed, okay? All right, and I'm going to zip right along to chapter 4. Now it came about that when Sandalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. Okay. Jesus said this. I want to read from John 15, starting at verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. One of the great promises of God. Man. That's right. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know the one who sent me. That's John 15, verses 18 to 21. Don't expect the world to love you. I mean, it's like Paul said, you know, we're, we're to seek the approval of God. Remember, I just said that's what they yes. gained by faith. But the fact is, if you're, if you're seeking the approval of God, if you're, if you're seeking the approval of men, Paul said, I couldn't be a bondservant of Christ. It's one of the it's other. A, it's a dangerous, dangerous mm -hmm. thing. Now, God, when you're doing things that are pleasing to God, he may make you know your enemies friends with you. That's, But that's not the goal. No. The goal is to show yourself approved unto God. God. That's the, That's got to be the goal in your life. So in verse 6, 4, 6, it says, So we built the wall, and the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. There it is, yep. In a mind to work. Mind, it says heart. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Hearts are probably a, a better yeah. translation. I, I don't have it, have it up right now. But that's, the fact is, if you're doing it, if you're doing your work as unto the Lord, I, I, an aside, I can't help myself here. Alice and I, you know, we go to England, spend a lot of time in England ministering over there for, as, as a base to other places. Mm -hmm. And on quite a number of years ago, it was the uh, Queen's birthday coming up. And they were having a contest yeah. of the top <clears throat> chefs all through the United Kingdom, two from each area, to see who would be have the privilege of making the, the, the luncheon for, the, birthday the, luncheon for, for the, the Queen's Queen. birthday. And I thought, you know, you see these guys. These are guys who are... Uh, Wide renowned. I mean, they're yeah. famous in England. They're they're wealthy. World they world. they own restaurants. But when it came to the opportunity to make something for the Queen, it was like whoa. And in England, they have what's called a royal warrant, yes. which is a real prize. What it says is, if you know, if you're a shoemaker or anything, and you have been chosen to make shoes for the royal household. You get this royal warrant. It says by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen. That's that's great. Well, you have if you're a Christian and you go to work, you have a royal warrant. Yes, we do. Because all that you do, you're doing by appointment to His Majesty mm -hmm. the King of Kings, mm -hmm. the Lord of Lords, and that has to be in your mind. Yes, it has to be that you're you're an ambassador for Christ. Every place you go, you represent the Kingdom of God. No matter what it is, we do it for him. That's why there's such danger in becoming involved in worldly politics. Yes. Yeah. Because ambassadors, I mean, I, you know, we have lived in foreign countries. I can't vote. I can't participate. You know, we're there. I have to pay all of the taxes. i got to obey all of the laws. 
but we're not part of that society. We're there, we're in it, but we are not of it. Yeah. Be prayerful about this because it's very, very important, particularly in this day and age. Okay? Think about these verses. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. They had a mind to work. Mm -hmm. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. We have to have that unity. That's Philippians 2.2. 2. That unity that binds us together in all that we do. And in the book of Acts, it says, Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together. This is the early church. Mm -hmm. Taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts 2, 46 to 47. You know, if you want to get more people in your church and you think it's getting done by programs that you're running, by nicer music, by bigger buildings, by Dunkin' Donuts, or you know what it is? It's when you have that same mind. Mm. Breaking bread. When having, that's when God will give you a favor and he'll add. He's got to be the one that will add the numbers, not, not you. He will draw all men unto him. So pray this, what, what Paul said in Romans 15, 3, 5, rather. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. This is a gift from God. Don't, don't let anything steal that gift away. Don't let division. Let there be no division among you. That's what the Word of God says. That's what the Word of God commands. So how do we wind up with thousands of different Christian denominations? Oh. Answer me that. <laughs> okay. I don't know how many time. I want to get into this. So 417. Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand, doing the work, and the other holding a weapon. Wow. And the twelve summoned the congregation of disciples and said, it's not desirable to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. That's in Acts chapter 6, all right? Mm -hmm. Acts 6, 2. The fact of the matter is, you better take your weapon to work. That's right. You better never go anywhere without the, your sword. Revival doesn't always happen in the walls of a church building. I'm telling you, true revival happens out there, all right? right. True revival will probably happen in in the gas station, in the grocery store, out there in your workplace, when you're being faithful, having the Word of God with you. Okay, I, I, we're not going to have enough time. I do want to say, though, one of the greatest revivals that I've seen, that I have seen, was back in the 70s, late 70s. I was a pastor of a church up in, in New York, in one of the suburbs of New York City. And I took a job as a national sales manager for a company. When I went to work there, we had revival there. Yes. And I'll tell you more about that when we start up again next week. Because time flies when you're having fun. That could be the whole well, Bible study. So Father, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the gift of your spirit, which was sent to lead us into all truth. We thank you for your hand upon our life. We thank you that you are leading us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And Father, by the power of that spirit that you've placed within us, I pray that we would be faithful to the end. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God bless you and goodbye until next time. We love you. Amen. He really, really loves you.